Uh, first, I want to thank you um, to, to my host, you, uh, Dr. Deepa Chakrabarti, and to your colleagues in the uh, Amity School of Languages at Amity University. Thank um, you, sir. And uh, to your colleagues as well. And I'm honored to be here with you. I'll speak for about 15 or 20 minutes. Yes, sir. Here is questions and interaction with my audience. So one of my favorite forms of teaching is one-on-one -on -one and tutorials, supervisions. I was a tutor at Harvard and supervised um, students at uh, Cambridge as undergraduates. And um, so I really like that. And um, so I, I'm happy and very open to all sorts of questions and would be pleased to engage with you your colleagues and, and the students. So I'll just read a little bit. I prepared a, something just for you, but obviously I started writing about this topic in my early 20s. So I've been thinking about it for a little while because I'm a little older than my, my early 20s now. So I actually started writing about this more the time of undergraduates or early postgraduate students. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, because when we agreed on this, I decided to write about Shakespeare and history. So I'm only going to mention Macbeth once, but I'm happy to answer any questions about Macbeth. It's a great play, uh, but you maybe you'll see the logic of what I'm doing. So what I, this is the shape of this talk. We have some general comments on history and poetry and theater. Then I move on to Shakespeare generally. Then I look at Shakespeare's history play, and then I have a conclusion. So let me just read this a bit. I always prefer not to read, but when we only when there's when it's online and we have this new technology, um, it's good for me maybe to do this and then to answer questions and hope for the best with the technology. So history and poetry, the nub is the relation between word and world representation or mimesis and reality. History is about past and present, fact and what is. Poetry is about what might be or could have been. History is about was and is. Poetry is about possibility. The word history in Shakespeare's day meant a story and a story about the past. Muthos in ancient Greece poetry is mythical as well as factual, exploring what can be imagined and with what happened. Now, can everybody hear me? Am I clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I going too slowly, too quickly? Am I all right? You are perfect. Are you sure I'm far from perfect, but as long <laughs> as everybody can hear me? No, no, you are very audible and uh... It's very good. The space also is not too fast. So, okay, good. Because I understand. actually, my father was a poet and my parents met in play. And they, of course, a lot of people, what they do is they speak very quickly. The whole idea, even with native speakers, is to speak clearly and not so fast, especially when people can, can uh, put this, uh, you know, when they're just hearing it, right? Yes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about three figures in the Western tradition that I think give us a framework for Shakespeare and history. And what I'm going to focus on is the whole notion of mimesis or imitation or representation. Mimesis being the ancient Greek word, on the idea of universals and particulars. So the first person I'm going to talk very, very briefly, just a couple of sentences about, you can ask. I'm happy to elaborate on any of the things we're talking about. Is Plato? Excuse me for a sec. Plato in the tenth book of Republic, for instance, has Socrates express his suspicion about poetry. Is afraid that poetry can undermine the balance of the just person and the just Republic, and that poetry is at three removes from reality. Socrates, and uh, of course, is also being represented, represented by Plato. And Plato is one of the great stylists of ancient Greece. 
he is one of the most poetic writers, even though he's a philosopher. So it's as if Plato feared in his own soul his ability to create beauty as a seduction from truth and justice. So that's a great tension among the Greeks and between philosophers and poets. Often what Plato would do is he would concentrate on Homer. One of the reasons was Homer, the way Shakespeare became an English-speaking culture, Homer was the center of Greek education at the time Plato was writing. And Plato and Socrates were trying to move philosophy into the center and poetry a little bit to the side. So there was a tension between those two things. My most recent book is called Aristotle and His Afterlife. So I'm interested in some of these and we can talk about it. So Socrates says that poets are not wise. They actually represent the world through mimesis, and they do so at three removes from reality. They're three steps away from reality. Aristotle, remember, Socrates was Plato's teacher. Plato was Aristotle's teacher. I'm sure you know all these things, but I'm talk for a wide audience. I'm somebody who's not been exposed to our, who are um, well-versed. Uh, Aristotle then, in poetics, looks at universals and and particulars. Plato had placed philosophy above poetry as the most universal form of wisdom and knowledge. Aristotle did the same thing his teacher did. He put philosophy above poetry, but guess where history was? History was in third place because the Greeks valued general knowledge, universality. They understood because they were very smart people. Remember, the Greeks helped to invent the West. They had 10,000 aristocrats who created all these, these breakthroughs in science, philosophy, literature, mathematics. And so history was about particular. So Aristotle placed it below poetry which was below philosophy. Now, Philip Sidney, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare's, and I could, I know, because my second language is French, we could talk about French writers too. I've written about Moliere and others, but, uh, and some of my ancestors left um, uh, France during the wars of religion um, in the Renaissance. But basically, uh, uh, Philip Sidney, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare's, and we can talk about him, but I'll tell you just what I want to say a little bit about him, just a few sentences before we get to Shakespeare. In puts poetry above philosophy. He's a poet. He says, no, no, no. Plato has it wrong. Aristotle's got it wrong. Poetry is above philosophy. And this is why he says it's the case. Poetry, philosophy for, for Sidney, and personally, I don't care about hierarchies like this. I think poetry is great, history is great, philosophy is great, physics is, painting. I think it's ridiculous and parochial for me to say, because I'm a poet and a historian, and it's intellectual historian, that these things are the most important things for, you know, at the moment, one of the most important things is to enjoy life, but also to fight things like locusts and coronavirus, right? These things um, do come up, and we have to use science to 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 fight them. Um, so Sidney puts poetry above philosophy. He says that poetry is more universal because through concrete images, it is more memorable and moves people to virtue. So history is still third for Sidney, and he scorns it as being mouse-eaten records. Okay. Am I still going the right pace? Is it okay? So, yes. Okay. It, the most important thing is for me to relate to you as an audience, and this is one time thing. So it's important for me to know. So thank you for telling me. Uh, let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. Shakespeare combines poetry and history, and that's one reason I am Aristotle means by poetry. Aristotle means poetry is a center 
of literature. Drama is this one is tragedy and epic are the center of Aristotle's poetics. So basically, drama is poetry for Aristotle. Shakespeare writes dramatic history and the history play. His, and I, that's the distinction. He writes a lot about history, but you'll find out why not everything he writes about history is considered a history play. His first folio, Shakespeare, when he died in 1616, half his works hadn't appeared, at least. He was very careless for a genius. He didn't really take care of, he didn't have a, bi a biography written about him. Queen Elizabeth I didn't. Now we're in an age where every politician has many things written about him or her, but Shakespeare and Queen Elizabeth, and Shakespeare, Queen Elizabeth was brilliant. He, she wrote in Greek and Latin and there's no slouch, but we have very little about him. So he died rather carelessly and left his plays. So two of his friends imitated Ben Johnson, who in who himself in the year of the death of Shakespeare in 1616 collected his works and his works in English, ordinary people, right? And it was only for a couple of hundred years that across with the years war and so basically um shakespeare was a playwright he wrote in english so they sort of imitated ben johnson and hemmings and condell were fellow actors and friends when shakespeare died he gave them a mourning ring which in those days was a death skull so people could the skull the memento mori they could remember death and the but Hemings and Condell, as the editors, divided Shakespeare's plays into only three kinds or genres. It's all history, comedy, and tragedy. That was it in the big first folio, which is the most popular book along with the Bible in English traditionally. Abraham Lincoln had three books, major books, his law book, Bible, and Shakespeare. Basically, Shakespeare became part, the way Homer had, part of, of, of um, education in the English-speaking countries. The history plays as Hemings and Condell decided to do it. This was plays based on English history, on the history of England, not of Scotland, not of Wales, not of Ireland, not of France, not of Rome, not of Greece. Shakespeare looks at the past in other kinds of plays like tragedy and comedy, ones that have dramatic history. But the history plays are, in view of Hemings and Condell, the only history plays. We may agree, we may not. They're his friends. They knew him. This is how they did it. He represents, Shakespeare represents Scottish history and Macbeth. There's my little reference to Macbeth. Uh, British legendary history in King Lear, and Danish legendary history in Hamlet, British and Roman legendary history in Cymbeline, ancient Greek history in Troilus and Cressida, ancient Roman history in Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra, and so on. The history plays are about England and were written about 1588 to about 1613. The ruler, who's ruling the country. So these plays have a very strong political element to them. Two of the plays and two of these 10 history plays, there are only 10 history plays. Shakespeare wrote about 37 plays that we have. Two of the plays stand on their own. King John is about tensions between England and Rome and church and state. And this would be a very interesting, even though King John was the king during Magna Carta in 1215, right? But this would be very interesting to Shakespeare and his contemporaries because Henry VIII had broken from the Roman church and they still had a lot of tensions. And um, that's why my French, my French relative ancestors ended up in England and North America because of the tensions Reformation created. Henry VIII is a history of the Tudors because only uh, Richard II represents a Tudor before this. Uh, so in other words, 
before this whole play about Henry VIII, Elizabeth I's father, she was the queen that Shakespeare began writing with. She was the queen when he was born, he died. But basically, Henry VIII probably wouldn't want to write that while Elizabeth was alive because it was her father. And even though James I was a cousin, he wasn't a tutor, he was a steward. And so it was a different dynasty or dynasty, right? And so at the end of Richard III, Shakespeare includes Richmond or Henry Tudor, who is Elizabeth's grandfather and probably James I's great grandfather. Um, and so basically, Richmond became Henry VII, who is Henry VIII's father. But the only play that deals entirely about the Tudors is Henry VIII. And that is 10 years after Elizabeth died. Okay, so what I'm really talking about here is the danger of politics. At the Typology is a theological term, of course. That means there's Jewish typology, but there's also Christian typology. I'll talk about Christian typology. What it means is a link between the past of the Old Testament and the present and the New Testament. Adam and Christ are types of each other. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the type for the cross that Jesus dies on. So there are all these symbols. And in a sense, what I'm saying is history involves a typology between past and present. And Shakespeare understands that very well. And I think that's one reason he waits to write about Henry VIII. England, remember, did not have freedom of expression then. Poor old Thomas More, who was a friend of Erasmus. He was the most powerful civil servant in England, the head of the public service. Well, he was a favorite until he didn't favor the king moving the church, make it the Church of England rather than the Roman church in England. And he lost his head. So, and Ben Jonson was in Shakespeare's friend and playwright, became the poet laureate, but one time he was in he was in prison. So often. You have to re remember, well, you know, we didn't do it that way. Well, democracy, there was always a parliament and there were courts, but you'd much rather be before a court in England in 2020 than in 1563 or 1600 or 1536. Just is like that. So things develop. There's more freedom of speech. Um, you know, there's even satire with our leaders, right? Um, in Canada, the US and the UK, there's a huge amount of satire and comedians who make fun of their leaders. I'm not saying this is necessarily something that is totally wonderful, but it means freedom of speech. They can't be thrown into jail and so on. Shakespeare's day, you could be. Uh, Shakespeare probably wrote Henry VIII with John Fletcher. He sometimes collaborated on plays sometimes with younger playwrights. The play is like a romance with an Elizabeth during the reign of her cousin, James Stewart. So the baby Elizabeth appears in the play, and then there's this great elegiac passage about the great peace and what a great ruler she was. Um, the Tudor dynasty was over, but Shakespeare remembered it in his history, past and present. So there's not just the past and present between um, Shakespeare's day and our day, which I'm going to emphasize at the end of this talk. But there's also within Shakespeare's life, his past and his present, Tudor dynasty and his his present king, because he he was part of the Lord Chamberlain's acting company when Elizabeth was alive, and it became the King's Men because James was so interested in the theater. Although he did Shakespeare had played before Queen Elizabeth court. Okay, now we're getting to the English history plays. This is the next part. And I'm going to use the Greek plays, basically, or four groups of works, right? Um, literally means, well, anyway. Um, the first tetralogy is a series of four plays. And Shakespeare wrote this first. He wrote history. There are eight plays that are all a series. But he wrote the first four 
he took the end of the story and wrote it first. So when you saw the plays that are later, even though at their earlier time, his audience knows more about it. So that involves a certain amount of dramatic irony, which as you will re remember, is when the audience knows something that one of the characters doesn't, right? All right, so there's a series of four plays, one, two, and three, Henry VI. And the fourth play, Richard III. And this is about history, English history, from the death of Henry V and the reign of Henry VI, the death of Richard III, and the rise of Henry VII, who began the Tudor dynasty, as I've been explaining. The Henry VI plays are quite episodic with long speeches. Shakespeare's quite young when he's writing. And he's, he's helping along with Christopher Marlowe to, in England, to invent something that is not just a chronicle play, but a history play. Not one episode after another, basically. It's well-shaped and the characters. One of the things, Marlowe is, was the same age as Shakespeare and was a genius like Shakespeare. People don't like the word genius anymore, but I'll say that just to provoke thought. He was killed, murdered when he was 28 or 29. And he's got terrific language, Mar Marlowe's mighty line of iambic pentameter, which neither Marlowe nor Shakespeare invented, but they made it sing. So it became perhaps the leading form of English verse after that. And even to this day, it's influential. But basically what happened, and some of this I'm adding that's not in my talk that I've written down, right? The difference is because Marlowe's Edward II is a wonderful history play. The one and Tamburlaine the Great, parts one and two, are also epic theater before Brecht, right? But basically, what's interesting about it is that Shakespeare has this incredible ability to take minor characters and give them one or two lines, and they're memorable, like the drunken porter in Macbeth. And you know, Macbeth himself. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, that terrific soliloquy. And, you know, Lady Macbeth speaks differently out, out damn spot. But the images he uses for her are different than Macbeth's. The way he portrays evil in both of them is quite different. Macduff speaks him. So it's the amazing ability of Shakespeare to give language, to create character that is so distinct. And that's where he starts He in the history play. The Henry VI plays are really wonderful. I'd be quite happy, most of us would, right, to, to write those. But Richard III is the character of Richard III, which he takes out of Thomas More's Tudor portrait of their great enemy, Richard III. The victors wrote history. He takes that portrait of a monster. Richard III was dug up recently in Leicester in England under a car park, right? Um, so they found his body just a few years ago after all those years. So, you know, over 500 years before they found him. But anyway, he probably wasn't quite more in Shakespeare. But Shakespeare, as I will get to, is a poet before anything else. He's a historian in some ways, but he's a poet. So he wants to make a good character, have an interesting plot, and uh, attract and keep your attention. So Richard III is, is um, quite an amazing play. You know, the Henry VI plays, long speeches, as I said, he's young. It represents the civil wars and the tensions around a young and weak king. Henry VI came to the throne as a child. Richard the Italian King, partly based on Thomas More's portrait of Richard III as a monster. From about 1588 or so to 1593, Shakespeare wrote the end of this history of the Civil War and went on and off from that. The Civil War went on from on and off from 1399 to 1485. The English fought long wars with the French, the Hundred Years' War. And look at this one. This war, it's a bit of a long time for a war, I would think. Um, probably war shouldn't go on at all, but they do. That's a long time. Okay. Um, 
So basically, um, what happens is uh, this, that's the first tetralogy. Those, those are his earliest plays, but about the second half of the story. Second tetralogy, which I'm going to talk about more, it is the four plays, Richard II, one and two Henry IV, and Henry V. They were written from about 1590. Henry V was probably written about the same time as Julius Caesar, another great play, a history uh, about the history of Rome, ancient Rome, but not about England. All right, they represent the period from about 1399, these four plays in the second tetralogy, the English victory over the French at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. Horace speaks about Henry V. So chaos comes again, as Othello might say, with the loss of France. We can talk about the close relation between France and Italy too later if you'd like, um, because the English aristocracy was French in many ways, Normans, who were Vikings who spoke French, as you um, no doubt know. But the two great influences beyond Greek and Latin on English literature were French and Italian, as well as the native. Shakespeare speaks Renaissance, early modern English. Richard II, the first play, is tragic. It's about the fall of King Richard, but it is also comic in structure for Bolingbroke, who rises and becomes Henry IV. Bolingbroke is Richard II's cousin, and he usurps his throne. So it's the tragedy of Richard II, who's the protagonist, but it's also the rise of his cousin. And because of that, we have two kings. A very famous scene in this play is Act 4, Scene 1. And again, I don't have this in my talk, but I'll add it here. Act 4, Scene 1 is called the deposition scene. And there's one beautiful moment where they're talking about kingship and about the past. There's a crown, and Richard says, seize the crown. And it's as if they both got one hand on each side of the crown, but you can only have one king. And in one of the main theories of kingship, and there's a great book by Ernst Kantorowicz, 1957, where you have the mortal body and the divine body, the body of the office of the king, the symbolic body, which we still have today with, with the crown. I'm, a, I'm English and I'm also Canadian. Um, but basically, um, what that is, is in the phrase, the king is dead, long live the king. We could say the queen is dead, long live the king when Queen Elizabeth died, and so on. But it's that symbolic moment that the king is dead, but in the same sentence, long live the king, basically in the same. So the continuity of the divine body, or the body of the official office of kingship or of the monarch. So that's a very key scene in Richard II. And in this play, Shakespeare represents the nature of politics and kingship. Obviously, I'll probably go on for longer than I said I would, but basically I can't talk about too many things. What I'll do now is I'll try to digress less because I've given you the background in three hours, okay? I always think it's good to try to keep to the time. So in both parts, of, of, of Henry IV, Shakespeare represents uh, the civil wars, and he represents different worlds, the world of the rebels, the rebel camp, the court, the and the tavern. He, with these worlds, he presents different perspectives on kingship. Um, Henry IV, Hal, Hotspur, Glendower, all have distinct views and characters. The second part of Henry IV is darker and more satirical. Hal becomes Henry V and rejects his friend Falstaff, the great comic misleader of youth. Henry V, the last play, includes choruses that call attention to theater and balances the epic and the anti-epic, the heroic and the anti-heroic. The second tetralogy focuses on language, self-conscious theater, and kinds of genre. In language, Shakespeare and of Christ in Richard II. He represents images of fat and thinness and waste in one and two Henry IV. And he has epic images of war 
and also violence and rape, Henry V. Self-conscious theatricality occurs in language and the very theater and its props. In Richard II, York speaks about the old king and the new king in the streets of London in his, as in scene of two, act two, scene four of the first part of Henry IV, Falstaff and Hal play the roles of Hal and Henry IV, of father and son, and then reverse them. And by doing that, they call attention to the stage, to the theater, to the props. And so the connection between the history play, the world, reality. In, Hen in, in the second part of Henry IV, Shakespeare represents Henry V's re rejection of Falstaff, dramatic moment, theatrical in the theater of history. In Henry V, the chorus is compressed them, Shakespeare represents history dramatically. Theater and world Shakespeare highlights in these choric speeches. Shakespeare shapes his time, his history plays through kinds of genre. Richard II is a history play with tragic elements. Henry IV part one is a history with comic aspects. Henry IV part two is a history with satiric threads. Henry V is a history with ironic conclusion because I realized I was digressing too much and maybe explaining too much. I'm just going to finish now. This is my last part. To conclude, Shakespeare moves his audience with his history plays, combining particulars and the general or universal. He mixes history and poetry. History has changed and since Shakespeare's time has become more scientific and based on what happened and on evidence. Shakespeare helps us to think about history then. We have narratives and dramas of history, but history like historical fiction, uh, sorry, history unlike historical fiction cannot change <laughs> chronology or events. Aristotle said that long ago. History is what happened and poetry can change what was. He valued universals over particulars. Poetry represents what might or could happen. Shakespeare's history plays are plays or poetry first. And while he is accomplished in representing history, he is not shy of anachronism or adding fictional characters to his historical drama. Shakespeare has long delighted and instructed, as Horace would say, and is important to our understanding of history, poetry, and theater. Dan Cott once wrote that Shakespeare is our contemporary. He is and is not but he still speaks to us across the world. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor okay. uh, Jonathan Hart. Uh, so uh, the session is now open to question answer. And uh, let me see how what the questions are coming. So all the participants, you are now requested to give your questions. Do you have questions in mind? Uh, I cannot see any questions as, as of now. Okay, uh, this is, Subrani Shaha, who is writing, the first question is, uh, of course, there are many uh, things like good explanation and a uh, lot of uh, remarks are coming. Uh, the question has appeared just now. Is it that the, sir, I will be reading the question. Is it that the plays of Shakespeare are based on true historical events? In these English history plays, they are. Um, now, Shakespeare may do what poets do sometimes, since he makes um, Hal and Hotspur the same age, when in history, uh, they are, Hotspur is older than Hal. He makes them young rivals, so he can have Falstaff as a kind of surrogate father, can have Henry IV as a father, he can have the young rivals, so he can show that Henry IV is um, uh, is favoring Hotspur and underestimating his his own son. So they're based on historical events and the chronicles of Hollandshed and Hall. Sources like Tom knew about the past as much as possible on writings about events. But sometimes Shakespeare uses psychology. He adds events. He changes the timeline a bit. So he, as I said, is a poet working with actual events. 
there is also a question whether you can focus a little bit more on Macbeth. Yeah, sure. Um, when you asked me, you said I could speak about anything I wanted and um, <laughs> view of history. Macbeth is also from Chronicles. Holland Hollandshed, Hollandshed wrote about England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland. And so Shakespeare would go, it's one of his favorite books, he'd go and read it and then he'd think, well, how can I make a play out of this? Now, we've lost a lot of English plays. So who knows whether there are other plays about Macbeth out there. Hamlet, we've we lost what's called the Hamlet tragedy. It does deal with, you know, a sort of a moment of Scottish history. It looks at it from the view of the chronicles. Modern historians would probably have a different view of Macbeth. And they might look at him as an administrator and so on just as they would with Richard III. But Shakespeare, it's one of his four great tragedies. He's, most of his plays are wonderful. And I think that what's interesting about it is that it's as if Macbeth discovers the darkness within him. And Lady Macbeth helped the darkness, the evil within. But then neither of them, especially Lady Macbeth, who prompted him to be ambitious, Goes mad. No doubt, damn spot. She's washing her hands just the way, you know, um, one of Dickens' characters, a lawyer, washes his hands, um, jaggered, I think, because to wash his hands of the case. So uh, I think the, you know, the, and the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech are absolutely beautiful. A meditation on time within a play about the Scottish past. And remember, this is about the time James the First, who was James the Sixth of Scotland and James the First of England. He held both crowns, even though both countries were separate. But this was a way of of representing Scottish history and introducing the Scots, London, to the court. Say more, but say what I said, or yeah. In fact, uh, that's a kind of universal, uh, you know, thing. It takes like some wrongdoings uh, that have been committed that cannot pay off. So maybe that message also to the people, uh, which uh, can be highlighted here. So yes, I think it's, uh, no, no, if there's another question, I can always, we can add. Uh, no, I'm just looking at the questions, question. but uh, it's on the same thing, like uh, the, uh, the feeling of guilt uh, and if you do something wrong, you cannot prosper in life. So there was a comment on that. So maybe that yes, kind well, of tough, message. But it's also yes, very sir. tough being a human being and not and being perfect and not doing anything wrong. Yes. So I'm not saying we should be like Macbeth and be be a murderer. Mm -hmm. That this is the old idea in Christianity that some people have of original sin that somehow divine grace, even Macbeth can be saved, but somehow he doesn't choose, he doesn't choose that path, he just keeps going. As Winston Churchill basically said, when you're in hell, keep going. Macbeth does that, but he never gets through hell, he seems to stay in there. But yes, um, Shakespeare shows a lot of guilty consciences in, um, in his work, where people are dying and they, they feel guilty about something. Yeah. And Macbeth and Lady Mac, especially Lady Macbeth is, is um, one of the great examples in Shakespeare. Yes, sir. Sir, there is one question coming from a faculty member. Uh, sir, please throw light on Shakespeare's apocrypha. Yes. Um, well, there are a lot of people over the years, there's nothing new under the Shakespearean sun. Sometimes people will be on the front of Time magazine for discovering things that were discovered 300 years ago about Shakespeare. Uh, we don't know much about it because he was preparing his works. So we had people who, there was one fellow, William Davenant, who said he was Shakespeare's illegitimate son, Sir William Davenant. People would, there were forgeries um, in the 18th century where it was supposed to be lost plays of Shakespeare. Uh, sometimes what happened was 
there are, um, you know, plays where um, uh, Shakespeare, people will say, well, Shakespeare didn't write that. Two no Riverside Shakespeare. So there's a whole business of forgery, the whole business of collaboration, and the whole business of Shakespeare. We only have a few of his signatures. We may have a few lines right Thomas More fragment. We're not absolutely sure. That's all. That's it. So you can see that's fertile ground. But the way you can tell forgeries is what paper was it written on? You can date it. It's like the Hitler diaries, which were fake. But at first, uh, Hugh Trevor Roper, um, Lord Dacre, thought for about a week that they were genuine. Um, so, um, so there, there are always things at the edge, and then people are trying to say, no, Middleton wrote this, or no, that's more Fletcher, et cetera. And I think it's really hard coming. to prove. Yeah, okay. So, uh, there's a question like, uh, the first question that has come up, the winter still, would you call it anti-feminist? The winter still. Uh, well, okay. I, I. Early on, uh, yes, women's studies in the 1980s of a series of feminist lectures. I've written on Barbara Johnson and a number of feminists and women writers. So I have great sympathy for it. Uh, what happens with Shakespeare is everybody claims them. Marxists claim them, feminists claim them, uh, capitalists claim them, everybody claims them, right? But one of the difficulties is Shakespeare is a person, excuse me for a second, Shakespeare is a COVID, I have to use a Kleenex and not scratch, right? Um, it, which Shakespeare is a, um, is in a sense, writes about women and Lady Macbeth and all sorts of different women, strong women, women that aren't so strong. He writes about weak men, strong men, hard men, politicians, poets. So the thing about Shakespeare is he had something called, that Keats called negative capability which means he can empathize with all his characters. And so like, as for great books of Sanskrit, you can take a certain part of it, Just look at it that way. It's like an equation. You freeze all the variables to look at this one. And cl race, class, and gender are all important, but people who focus on them, even though they're all important, forget sometimes that they are not by themselves. They're operating with lots of things. So. I would say the winter's tale and so I don't know there's any, it, it shows a man who is jealous the way Othello was and mistreats a woman. Desdemona was mistreated, Ophelia was mis, mistreated. Hamlet wasn't particularly good to her. Um, and her father and, and Laertes, she got caught between these three men and eventually drowned herself. Very tragic. And with, uh, with Winter's Tale, Leontes becomes, you know, very jealous of his wife, Hermione, and she, in a sense, dies symbolically. It's not a realistic plot. So what happens is they're reconciled at the end, and it seems really corny. It seems crazy. Why would Shakespeare have a statue come back to life? She's still alive. She looks like a statue. Couldn't he recognize his own wife after all those years? Well, those are assuming that Shakespeare wanted to be realistic. So another question is coming up. And yeah, so basically, is, I would say it's symbolic. And in a way, it it celebrates her more than it criticizes her. And it criticizes the jealousy more of the man, I would think. Okay, so, so the next question is, do you believe that English history plays as a buyer's criticism of the country. I didn't get the question actually. It's coming from one of the students, masters. I think I understand it. So, yeah, whether the history, I think he wants to ask uh, whether the English history, quote unquote, is a biased, uh, I think Shakespeare is biased, doing a biased criticism of his country. Maybe that is what he meant. Okay, I, I understand. I, I think sometimes, obviously, when he um, when he represents the French in Henry V, doesn't they were very arrogant because they thought they were going to defeat the English. They had a much bigger army. 
In the actual battle, the horses and the soldiers, the aristocrats, drowned in the mud. But the, it was one of the greatest English victories. It was a small group, a small army that was sick, and it won. Shakespeare may be biased in one sense, but he makes Hamlet into a genius, and he's Danish, right? Yes. Uh, he takes Roman history and makes Antony and Cleopatra the most magnificent language. Uh, you know, his favorite writer, in some ways, one of it was Montaigne, right? And so one of his favorite writers. So I think in some ways he has to, you know, he has to talk about England as the golden place. Sometimes he's very critical where he, he has one of the characters and Shakespeare's not his characters. Shakespeare is up above there. And just because one character in his history play says the English ape Italian manners, right? At another point, John of God is talking about England in the most beautiful ways. Sounds like a precursor of William Blake's uh, poem about England that's used as an anthem now in England, the green and pleasant land. But he also, Blake writes about the black satanic mills. Shakespeare does all that. So he balances some of these things. I don't think it's just simply uh, English propaganda. And besides, he's such a great poet, he couldn't write propaganda, even if there's propaganda in the plays. So two questions are coming up. One is sure. the role of Lady Macbeth in the play Macbeth, same as portrayed in actual history. Uh, well, that's quite an obvious, obviously. Well, and obviously, <laughs> just to say, it may have some things, but Shakespeare, I don't know whether Hamlet was as eloquent in history as he was in Shakespeare's <laughs> play. And the same thing with Lady Macbeth. And because you have to realize James the First was uh related to the, somehow to Macduff, who was the hero yes. King James, and his his ancestors look a lot better than Macbeth. I imagine Macbeth maybe not have been quite as evil as the play makes him. Shakespeare makes him a, a wonderful poet too, doesn't he? Even if somebody's evil, he can speak great poetry, right? There's another question. Yeah, another question. Do Shakespeare's plays identify the society of his time. I think it's almost the same or uh, whether he has identified his Can I just his say time. that I'll, I'll answer it this way. I talked about typology. Shakespeare is writing history plays about the English past, but he's writing it for a present English audience. And we happen to read it in India or Canada or China years later. Yes. Past that is in some ways an allegory for the English present. So he has to take his English audience into account. So it reflects oh, them as well as it reflects history, because it reflects their tastes. Yes, sir. So any more questions from the audience? Uh, I There are a lot of uh, remarks coming, very informative. Thank you, sir. Wish to have another lecture. So that I can promise you, we will have uh, Professor Jonathan Lokat again and again, <laughs> if he says yes, only. <laughs> so a lot of people want to have your lectures uh, and uh, I think we can promise them, sir, some more lectures. Thank you. I, I'm sorry I, I talked longer than I said I was going to. But I wanted to make sure that I gave the background, but maybe I, I hope I didn't speak too long. No, sir, no, sir, it was not at all long. I mean, people are, I mean, most of the, dignitaries, uh, you know, the uh, participants, faculty members, teachers, they have all enjoyed and they have learned a lot. And they actually uh, is uh, giving their remarks and uh, they're wishing to have some more lectures by you. So well, that's very kind of you. And thank uh, them for coming and for your colleagues. Yeah. Okay, then uh, if it is just remarks and no question, we will uh, wind up the session. I thank all of you, dear participants, colleagues, teachers, not only from Amity, from other universities, other Indian universities as well.